Uh, yes, yeah, just acknowledge my co-authors, and I'm going to cover just a little bit that it's in this review, uh, which is in the uh, BMJ special edition. Uh, we all worked hard on this, and there's lots of good stuff in there. Uh, I'm just going to pick my little selection from that for uh, your delectation today. Um, and after John Yanides, I've had to incre increase my disclosures slope confessions slide. Um, so I do tweet. Uh, I'm an omnivore um, and uh, a wine drinker. I do occasionally have meat. No strong nutritional views before 2012. I confess I'm an ex-epidemiologist. Um, <laughs> I have given uh, lectures for food companies. Uh, I'm a consultant to a company looking at uh, personalized nutrition. I direct the British Gut Project. I've received grants. I've published epidemiological and nutrition studies, and I've done some trials. And I, as a plug, I do receive huge income from my best-selling book on diet and microbes, The Diet Myth. But that's what I was told to say, so there you go. Um, so um, why is this important? Well, part of this, this conference is all about uh, trying to get some consensus. And all the guidelines that I see uh, do have some consensus, despite um, views that uh, there isn't any consensus. So everyone says we should be eating less, less than we are, should have more fruit and vegetables, less highly processed foods, and uh, less sugar. Where there isn't consensus is on the issue of fat, on starch, on whether you should be grazing or gorging, uh, with effects of alcohol, food supplements, artificial sweeteners, or whether you should bother counting calories. And the reasons why this conflict exists, we, we, we've gone over before, but I think one of the main reasons is uh, we've ignored this new organ in our bodies, a virtual organ uh, for digestive and the endocrine system called the microbiome. And if you understand that, a lot more fits into place. So what is the microbiome? Um, it's basically the community of uh, microbes inside our guts, mainly in the lower intestine, 100 trillion of them, uh, bacteria and archaea, the same number of bacteria as there are cells in our body. So we're pretty much 50-50, 50% -50, uh, 50 human. There's even more viruses and phages, there's also fungi and parasites, and they all produce thousands of chemical metabolites. And We've co-evolved with them. We share 40% of our genes with them. So it's not by chance that they've just happened to be there. And they're the main driver of our immune system and the control of our digestion. And the important thing is, unlike uh, our genes, where we share 99.5% of our uh, genes with each other and our genetic variation, we probably only share about 25% of our microbes with each other. So no two people are the same. And I believe very strongly that we can tell much more about uh, your state of health from your microbes than you can from your DNA. And I've been a geneticist for the last 20 years. Now, um, every part of your body and has a community that is unique to you. So when you move your seat, someone can look at the air and the dust those microbes are, and they're very specific to you. And the same is true in your gut. And it will vary by just a half a centimeter in your skin, those communities. Now, other reason people are different is their response to food. Um, in the 1980s, uh, some Canadians did some twin studies, which are near to my heart, uh, which are hard to get ethical approval for now, where they locked up 13 student, student twin pairs, identical twin pairs, uh, in a Quebec university over the summer. They didn't let them exercise, and uh, they, they worked out what they should be eating, and they gave them all an extra 840 calories a day and saw what happened to them. And it turned out that on ex they all started slim, BMIs between 21 and 24, because students were slim in those days, um, and they all put on weight, but the difference was between four kilograms and 13 kilograms. So there's a huge range in what, how people respond to the same food. Now, some of that is due to genetics, but I believe there are still differences between the twins and other things explain that I think the microbiome explains. Now, the microbiota, which is the, 
the term for uh, the actual organisms, whereas the microbiome is, is actual the genes, um, has a series of inputs and outputs and interactions. And it's very much reacting to the environment as well as producing its own environment. And so um, all kinds of things can influence it from slight changes in the pH, from with the fibers going in, to all kinds of other hormones that it can produce, altering insulin, and potentially actually altering things like appetite and signals to the brain, which has been clearly shown in some very basic insect models, although it's obviously a bit harder to do that uh, in humans. Um, now, it's a hard concept to have. When you've got 100 trillion of these microbes inside you, how do you summarize that kind of data? And I think the best way to do this is to use an analogy um, of uh, a gardening analogy. So that if you're generally unhealthy, uh, you're overweight, um, and you have one of these conditions that I've listed here, uh, you're going to have a low diversity of species, which means you'll have less of them, and they'll be less different. They'll be producing less chemicals. So your gut microbe biome is going to resemble an Arizona backyard, okay, next to a toxic uh, waste dump. And that means that it's very susceptible to any weeds coming in and taking you over. It's very unstable. Whereas you guys are all super healthy, um, uh, low carb eaters. You know, you've got this amazing um, flora and soil that means that uh, you've got lots of species in there, just like your garden. The soil is full of a mixture of fungi and bacteria, everything is coexisting, nothing goes to waste, all those products are used, and you're producing lots of different chemicals that gives you flexibility. So if you think like that, the only common thing we have in all the case control studies done is that all of these conditions are associated with low diversity. In each one, there's a different set of microbes that may be preventive or risk factors, but the lack of uh, numbers is the key thing that, that is similar. Um, we published, uh, we've been working with uh, a, a group in uh, San Diego for the last five years on the American Gut, British Gut Project, and we published the results a couple of weeks ago on 11,000 citizen scientists who paid for their own microbiome testing. It's an interesting model, this. Uh, you can get research done, people pay for it through a fundraiser website, and the data is publicly available. And um, we learned quite a lot. Um, first, the, the, the UK, we may be the fattest in Europe, but uh, we're not the worst uh, in terms of diversity. The Americans had a least, less diverse microbiota than uh, the UK, although that's probably not saying much. Um, the other interesting thing is, so we could separate out people by geography and uh, by uh, grouping. The other key finding we found is that the number one determinant of uh, your microbiome diversity, and where, which we think is a reflector of health, uh, was the number of diversity of plants eaten per week. So uh, it was really the strongest factor was if you were eating 30 types of plant um, per week, and that included nuts and seeds and other, it was a broad terminology, but that was far more important than if you self-identified as vegan or vegetarian, which just implies that it's not so much the absolute factors that are important, it's the diversity and the amount of different vegetables, different plants you can put on your plate that are much more important. So to me, that was a very important take-home message. And the other one I liked was that if you drank wine, that was also a pup, a good factor, and if you liked... Uh, Spirits, it was a bad fact. Um, within our data set, we've measured three or 4,000 twins. And we have extensive um, disease data going back uh, 20 years. Um, and virtually everyone has some chronic disease by now because the mean age is 60. And we found associations with nearly every uh, condition we looked at. The number one condition was obesity. The most microbes were associated with that. Second was food allergy. No big surprise, they happen to be the two biggest epidemics of our time, and I think they're related, and I think they're related to microbes. 
And on the other panel, you can see um, the uh, drugs. Uh, it's hard to read this, I uh, apologize, but up here we have a number of drugs that are deemed safe for humans um, and uh, with no side effects. The number one is PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, have a very major effect in shifting the microbiota. They change the pH. You get a whole different series of microbes in there and evidence is building that increases risk of infection. Then you've got other ones. Uh, we have metformin for diabetes, has a major effect on its own. And opioids and other painkillers also interact with the microbiome. And in fact, uh, given that we have small numbers of these, it looks like nearly every medication uh, we take has some impact on our microbiota. At the moment, we're just not testing that when uh, these drugs go to market. Um, what about chemicals in food? Um, uh, there are many chemicals in food that I don't have time to go into, but um, a big debate at the moment is about if people are cutting out sugar, should they take artificial sweeteners? Um, well, there have been some studies on the microbiome uh, by um, my is Israeli colleagues, uh, and they showed that uh, both in mouse models and to some extent in small human studies, you do have an alteration of the gut microbiome which affects glucose tolerance. Um, artificial sweeteners are deemed as inert. Um, I have been doing my own experiments with my own glucose monitor, uh, and so uh, this was me. I was in a, a metabolic chamber last week, and uh, I took some sucralose, and you can see this clear peak of my blood sugar reacting to what's called a totally inert, harmless uh, uh, add additive, which is accounts for about 50% of the artificial sweetener market uh, in Europe, uh, which I think is a reflection. That doesn't happen in everybody. It might be a personal reaction, but just shows that these things are not inert, and our microbes, probably struggling to deal with it, produce abnormal chemicals in response. So we do need much more work there. Um, what happens um, if our microbes are deprived of fiber? We haven't heard much about fiber at this conference so far, and I don't think there's many voices. We, it's, a lot of it is all about fats and versus sugars, carbs, you know, poor old fiber, no one stands up and, uh, you know, it's just seen as a very boring uh, thing that just uh, makes you go to the toilet too much. But actually, it's key to a healthy microbiome and the bacteria convert the fiber, they ferment it, and they produce these chemicals and these short-chain fatty acids are seen as key to uh, helping our immune system. And the more you produce, it looks like the healthier uh, you are. And what happens when you're, you're fiber rich, you um, have plenty of microbe action and uh, your mucus layer, as you can see here, is uh, protected. Um, but studies have shown in animals that once you start reducing fiber uh, for long periods of time, your microbes actually start eating yourself. And they eat the mucus layer more than they should do, leading to problems in that gut barrier. Now, um, I did an experiment uh, uh, on uh, someone who um, actually wanted to do 10 days of eating McDonald's um, as a, a super-sized me experiment on the microbiome. He was a student. Uh, he was hard up for cash. And he also happened to be my son. <laughs> so he fitted the bill precisely. And uh, he did this for 10 days and didn't feel very well. And he lost about 30 or 40 percent of his gut diversity, microbiome diversity. He hasn't, hasn't yet regained it, as he keeps uh, reminding me. Uh, and probably this long-term effect of fiber deprivation is a uh, likely cause, rather than the fats, the sugars, the traditional reasons we think junk food are bad for you. Um, we looked in our twins um, at uh, the effect of fiber, and we see that uh, longitudinally, uh, women who have high fiber intakes have less weight gain, and for each gram of fiber, you can reduce weight gain by two kilograms. This isn't a randomized study, it's observational, but it gives you an idea that also the fiber correlated with microbiodiversity. So, uh, supportive evidence. In our twins, uh, we've looked at the genetic effects, and 
Unlike virtually everything I've studied, it's a really sl small effect overall. So it looks like diet has a much bigger effect on our microbiome than genetics, and it's around 11 or 12 percent heritability, although some microbes uh, do seem to be under strong genetic control, just a few of them, which is quite interesting why uh, some microbes prefer some people and not others. Um, within the twins, we looked at the discordant twins for obesity, and these are identical twins, and their microbes were nearly always quite different, and it turned out the skinny one had more diverse microbes and particular species of microbes um, that came up consistently. And the two we found were Christensenella and Acomantia, and not everyone has Christensenella. Uh, about one in 10 people seem to have it. These people seem to be resistant to get, gaining weight, and when we put these microbes into uh, germ-free mice, we could stop them getting fat. And um, this has been replicated in about five other cohorts around the world. It doesn't seem to matter whether you're in Korea, Japan, uh, the US, uh, or the UK. And we've followed up that work and found that the associations are actually much stronger uh, when we look at uh, visceral fat. Uh, so really strong effects of these microbes on visceral fat rather than BMI. Um, briefly, all the foods that can influence your microbiome. Obviously, we've got the high fiber ones, ones with high inulin, uh, the legumes. Um, but there's a whole range of other foods that in the past have been labeled as dangerous and bad for us, but now epidemiologically are turning out to be uh, useful. Uh, and the tide has turned, and generally these are seen as uh, beneficial on the most part. And it turns out that all of these, like the nuts, the seeds, the coffee, um, the red wine, the chocolate, uh, olive oil, all contain polyphenols. Polyphenols are fuel for your microbes. Okay? They're not some magical antioxidant that works directly. They fuel the microbes that then produce other chemicals. Then you've got all these other ones, this, uh, the probiotics, uh, such as your yogurt, your kefirs, um, your, your cheese, Live microbes are also helpful, and um, that's important to understand. So the, the greens, it's either fertilizer, prebiotics, probiotics, live microbes, or you've got the polyphenols. And ex this explains a lot of the epidemiology when you understand uh, that they're all beneficial in this way. Um, now, we've talked a bit about red meat, and a bit of controversy about whether it's good or bad for you, depending on which side of the fence you're on, but I think um, it could work both ways. It could, some of the epidemiology could be explained by a bimodal distribution because it looks like the microbes determine whether you convert some of the choline uh, and um, other uh, and carnitine in meat into a nasty metabolite, uh, TMAO, which is linked to atherosclerosis. And by changing microbes, there are about eight studies now showing that this, this has a a consistent effect. Some people can eat happily as much red meat as they like. Others may get this nasty metabolite. Um, yogurts come in and out of favor, and probiotics do as well. The, um, it, it, we used to think that nothing gets past the stomach acid, and that therefore it, it kills off and it was all rubbish. But it turns out that um, uh, probiotics and uh, yogurts may be working not by actually the microbes, but by the chemicals they produce. So we've got some uh, new data showing how um, the uh, yogurt eaters will have a very different uh, fecal metabolite profile uh, to non-eaters. And those metabolites are linked to the same ones that are beneficial for your visceral central fat. So we're getting a nice story here of how potentially these uh, health foods can work in ways we hadn't thought about. It's nothing to do with the fat. It's nothing to do with uh, the actual live microbe taking over. It's all about metabolomics and these chemicals. Um, personalizing diets, we're going to talk a bit more about this later, but I just wanted to um, say that the, uh, the ZV et al. paper, it was a real landmark paper by uh, Aaron Segal's team, showed that microbes are more predictive than the GI index of predicting response to glucose. Okay, And they did this in uh, 800 Israelis. 
I've tested my own glucose, and I can tell you that uh, if I have Marks and Sparks uh, orange juice, uh, I go up to the diabetic range as I do with grapes, but I can have as much pasta and rice and nothing happens at all, and my wife is completely the opposite. Um, we've started to replicate the um, Israeli study in our twins. We're looking at 1,000 twins with detailed uh, dietary interventions, and uh, we're also replicating this in a small group in the US. Um, and our first twins have come through, identical twins, because you might say some of this could be genetic, but within these twins, uh, they both love Prosecco. One of them really peaked with it, and the other one uh, had no response, which upset the one with the response no end, <laughs> um, showing that there is a big difference between individuals, um, and you can't explain that on genetics or early life upbringing. So I think the twin model adds an extra element of confidence to this idea that um, our microbes also are unique, but also many of our food responses. Um, lastly, at Fiona's request, I put this slide in. Um, these are frozen poo tablets um, from healthy donors, which the Americans call crapsules. <laughs> and if you take 30 of these, you can totally transform your microbiome. You don't have to worry about whether you're, what type of diet you're on. Uh, and it certainly works if you have Clostridium difficile infection, and this is the number one treatment in many countries, particularly the US, where it has a 90% success rate. Um, it's also being used for ulcerative colitis, where it has the same efficacy as anti-TNF therapy. It's still being trialed in other ones. It's a bit uncertain, but you have to be careful. You don't get these from someone who has a family history of obesity, because there have been a couple of anecdotes of people getting fatter on them. Um, so I haven't got, I'm running out of time here to say what we know and what we don't know. Uh, there's quite a lot we now know we didn't five years ago. Um, probiotics are, are useful, and in the review, we did do a meta-analysis showing that 18 out of 21 conditions, there was now decent uh, evidence about probiotics being useful. We don't know which ones, but it's all pointing that direction. Um, the, um, the questions we don't know are about are natural probiotics better than supplements? Can microbes actually influence what you, food you eat? Um, what about low-dose antibiotics, effects of pesticides? And I think, importantly, should all new drugs and food uh, chemicals be tested on the gut microbiome? So to finish, uh, I think, think of the microbiome as a garden, and you can't go far wrong. Microbiota are a key aspect of nutrition. Treat all foods as chemicals not as this old-fashioned Victorian view of macronutrients or calories which we should throw out the window. Treat microbes as, healthy, as helpful chemical factories. Um, promote trials on probiotics and prebiotics so we can actually get guidelines. Educate on fiber. Seriously explore all these other chemicals we're putting into our foods on our, on our gut. Realize the potential for personalized diets. And above all, encourage diversity and realize that with 100 trillion microbes inside you, you'll never truly eat alone again. Thank you.